this talk came about because Pete and I were, were sitting and talking about uh, a presentation on exotic exascale technology. And we talk about that a lot. And we probably could have given a pretty interesting talk to an audience of about 10 people who are narrowly interested in that exotic future. But then we decided, really, the foundations of all of this is the foundations of changing and perhaps more valuable to give a talk of this flavor. So with that. All right. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to try the uh, clip onto my uh, shirt. Is that is that still working for you? All right. Perfect. All right. So let's uh, let's dive right in. Uh, so, you know, the first lesson you might learn in computing is that uh, if you want to write an efficient algorithm, you minimize the operations. Uh, this is is classic to computing. It's the core of so much of computing. And it comes from this, this construct that operations equals time. Reduce the time. The way you reduce the time is you reduce the operations. And, you know, from the Knuth books uh, uh, to, you know, the uh, books on matrix computation, it's all about optimizing the best case, worst case, average case. I mean, how many people have taken this analysis of algorithms class? You look at bubble sort, you look at uh, uh, other types of sort. What do you do? You compare compares. You count them up, whichever algorithm has the least number of compares, that algorithm is faster. Well, slowly, this, this latest version in 96, there's a newer version out, people are starting to realize that, well, it's not quite like that. Operations is not quite equal to time. In the reality that we have today, we've hit a power ceiling on how much power we put into a socket, and the clock has pretty much leveled off. And so the real issue is, is data movement. Data movement is the power-hungry piece that is driving all of efficiency inside algorithms, inside uh, chips. And so the reality is that efficient algorithms are not ones that optimize operations. In fact, you might algorithm and make it more efficient by adding operations that rem that reduce the memory movement. This is a very simple graph here that shows how much uh, energy in picojoules it costs to do an operation like a double precision flop here, right? And how much it costs to move data. And you can see that movement is the operation right here, all, even just moving it 15 millimeters on a chip, that movement is the costly piece. So the first reality of is that it is not about minimizing operation. The lesson you learned in computing, if you uh, get on the web and look at this great website, code.org, people are saying, you know, learning about computer programming, here's how you do it. You could write your first program. You could write an Angry Birds program. You could get online here and take the Harvard class on uh, computer programming. And it's about writing code, writing sequential code. And you don't really need to learn about parallelism because that's like a special case. And if you look at this uh, course description, it's fantastic. It has in here, you know, abstraction, algorithm, encapsulation, resource, all sorts of great topics. The word parallel isn't in here, right? If you look at Arduinos and little tiny processors, they're single processors. We don't need parallelism. Well, the reality is this is wrong. The reality is that parallel, parallelism is everywhere in modern chips. And even after you go from this tiny little, you know, nothing, the very next step up, even in Internet of Things, is a dual core. And if you look at the kinds of things that we're looking at in the future, these Knights Landing and others, in fact, if you were to just plot how much performance you get out of a single core, it flatlined. So from 2007 to now, it has hardly improved. The, par the, the improvement of speed within a single core has hardly made any uh, difference. The real difference comes from just adding lots of these. So this is the socket, how, much, uh, how many flops, how much operations you get out of a socket. It is going up, Moore's Law, kind of goodness here for that period of time. Thread performance has not increased in any way, or, or minimally. Thanks, Pete. So parallelism, right? Software has to have parallelism to have any kind of performance. Third lesson that you've learned, right? And boy, the whole society has learned this. Am I okay on the mic? Uh, that computing increases exponentially and rapidly and for free, right? So you, you expect to go to the store two years from now and you get a computer that's twice as fast for the same price or maybe even cheaper. Uh, and this is a wonderful plot, and you've seen a hundred plots like this that talk about how Moore's Law is giving us this 
fact, Intel is still pronouncing that Moore's Law will continue not only through the next generation of process technology. Um, there was just this past week some articles by some uh, very distinguished technologists claiming that Moore's Law will last for another 10 years. Wrong. Turns out, um, the reality is that computing improvements have slowed dramatically already over the past decade. Uh, and famously, last year, actually it's almost two years ago now, the Lindley Group declared Moore's Law over, and they declared the strongest form of Moore's Law over. Right, so the strong every couple of years you get something much better for the same price, right? And this is plotting the price per uh, a transistor, or actually the total number of transistors you could buy for a fixed number of dollars. And what you can see is we're not on an exponential upward. In fact, in recent years, with recent process technologies, we're actually trending downwards. That is, the cost per transistor is actually increasing. Right, so this so-called bounty of Moore's law is actually well over in the mainstream. And there's a very nice article called No More, pun intended. Uh, and, and in addition, right, the corollary of this, right, is in fact that single thread performance has been increasing only very, very slowly, as Pete alluded to earlier, for the last seven years. And you know, it's no better in the last three or four years. I just could just get a better plot here. Um, and uh, you know, perhaps if you're buying Intel processors, you've done a little bit better. That's the two-second advert. They've been increasing at something like 21% per year, but nothing like the 100% every generation that people have been promising you and telling you that is happening because of more. Computing improvements have already slowed dramatically over the past decade. Uh, the third, the fourth lesson. We're up to the fourth lesson uh, is that computers run at a fixed and predictable speed. Right? People buy computers by gigahertz, right? So this is the thinker, right? There is no thinker by himself anymore or herself anymore. Thinkers have computers now, right? So this is a thinker holding a laptop connected to the internet, of course. And of course, what are they thinking about? What do we all think about? How fast is my computer, right? So, so what form could you give to a question like that? Well, one form of an answer is how many gigahertz does your computer have? That's, you know, most people say, oh, that's not right. You could talk about how fast it does things. 50 billion instructions per second. Well, that's a more informed answer. You could say 200 gigaflops, right? That's a classic. How many, how fast can I run Linpack on this computer? That's what a lot of scientists use as a metric. Or spec scores or other more sophisticated things, 3D marks. You know, maybe if you're a database person, you want to, yeah. But, the problem is, and, and, and this is all canonized in these classic charts you see, this is faster than that, this is faster than that. New processor is 1.5 times faster than the old one. Uh, and the problem with all of this thinking is that they mischaracterize the whole notion of performance inside of computers. So the reality is that performance is, al al already, is already highly variable in most computers. Uh, many systems have had a feature called Turbo Boost. That's the Intel term for it. Other systems have other names for it. Um, that was introduced seven, eight, nine years ago, uh, and in the beginning, but now it's a large multiple. So if you take this hot new MacBook that I'm sure you all looked at the the videos on the web for, just introduced and you know teasing you on the Apple website, you can see it, but you can't buy it yet because they won't give it to you. Um, has a processor in it that has a clock that scales from 1.2 gigahertz up to 2.9 gigahertz. That means the performance of a single processor goes from base to turbo, a factor of almost two and a half, right? And that number is likely to grow in the future. So we already have highly variable performance, even for a single core or a single processor. Computing systems have known for a while that we've had wildly varying performance. These are the John McAlpin's kind of benchmarks uh, for different levels of a memory hierarchy, right? Where registers you can access very fast, low L1 cache, L2 cache, DRAM unthinkably slow, and how unthinkably, maybe 150 times slower, right? Uh, but now we're seeing the introduction of not only uh, old non-volatile memory, like flash memory, which would be like 150,000 cycles in order to access it, but now there's this new excitement that is intended to complement DRAM or replace DRAM, which is also going to be something like thousands of cycles of access time. So there's this big, complicated, highly variable behavior you get out of these systems due to this kind of memory hierarchy as well as due to turbo boost or dynamic range kinds of techniques.
The, the fifth lesson uh, is that general purpose architectures deliver the best performance. This is one of the iron maxims of, of the software community and the iron maxims of uh, people who think about computing performance. And this was the idea that you've got a very rapid part of the curve as it was in the 90s of like 52% per year. And if you were off trying to build something more specialized, and there were literally hundreds of companies that did this and succeeded and then failed and then went out of business, right? The reason they went out of business is that Moore's law, this rapid growth of performance for general purpose, allowed the mainstream to overtake these general these specialized architectures. So the idea was, if you build something wonderful, and remember, this is a log plot, so this distance is really something wonderful, like two times or five times faster. As, as time went on, the Moore's law improvement of the general purpose architectures would overtake you, right? And you'd have a hard time staying ahead. And then this would happen again, and you get overtaken. So this is why these many, many companies went out of business. Um, but now it's the case that that Moore's law slope is much lower than it was, right? I showed you a 13% version of it. Maybe in the future, it's 5%. Maybe in the future, it's slower than the rate of inflation, 2% or 1%, or it depends on what country you live in. Maybe it's negative. But um, the, it's already the case now that we've seen this faster and more capable than general purpose processors. So here's an example of just a small amount of hardware acceleration being used to do Blu-ray encoding, right? Encoding of disk for Blu-ray uh, across a bunch of different formats. And you can see by adding hardware acceleration, in many cases, you can reduce the power requirement significantly. More dramatically, um, there are examples of people employing FPGA-based customization. Uh, and this is a bunch of data center workloads for various kinds of you know, media translation, uh, search. Uh, these folks have demonstrated that using a FPGA-based customized approach, um, that they can achieve as much as 20 times greater computational throughput per watt, even compared to the GPUs, which, of course, many people believe GPUs can be a factor of two, four, five, maybe faster even than CPUs. So the, the lesson here is that the, the, the maxim that general purpose computing always overtakes specialized is no longer true. So there's five wrongs of computing. Maybe I'll get my co-speaker to, to. So, so uh, as mentioned, efficient programs minimize operations. Of course, that's wrong. And all of you in your analysis of algorithms, in your designing algorithms, should be looking now at what operations, what additional operations could I do to minimize lo to minimize for locality, to optimize for locality, to minimize for data movement. I can measure. Oh. Uh, sequential efficiency uh, um, and program efficiency. Start with sequential, and then see if you can. Uh, uh, no, that's wrong. Uh, parallelism is baked into all of the chips. Parallel paths, parallel ways to access the cache, parallel ways to go to memory. And all of that must be considered in your algorithm. Your algorithm must begin with parallelism, and the special case is sequential. Thanks, Pete. Um, another one of the lessons that's deeply baked in is that computing rapidly gets faster and cheaper, right? So it's clear that it's not so rapid as it used to be, right? And it may be even less. Exponential improvement is over. Slow improvement will continue for a while. Uh, and then we'll see. Computers run at a fixed and predictable speed. Simplistic models of how fast a computer is and how to use it right, no longer really apply. Uh, we have systems that are increasingly dynamic and flexible. Their performance may vary on their own. Their performance may vary under program control. This can be a very good thing. right? You could decide you need to go fast right now. right? Um, but this is both a complication and potentially an advantage to be managed. And then finally, the old maxim that general purpose always wins, and this was the excuse for the software community to ignore all those accelerators and say that's too hard work and we just have to build portable general code. Uh, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I think that's over. Uh, and in the future, right, with this growing performance gap between customized hardware uh, the, and, and no cushion of Moore's law actually to enable the general purpose computing systems to catch up, um, I think people are going to have to deal increasingly with the opportunities and specialized kinds of systems. So that was it for the wrongs. I would actually 
challenge all of you to think about these things sort of deeply. Uh, often the reaction when you talk to people about these kinds of assumptions is that they're so deeply baked in, they don't even realize where they're baked in, in their thinking and their methodologies and the way they approach problems. Um, and almost all of these, I think all of these, are fundamentally game-changing at some basic level. Okay. Anyone upset yet? Somebody asked if they could send a heckler. <laughs> Tweeting away. So we promised to say something constructive as well. So now we're going to try and give some guidance for how these changes make a difference for how you might think about future computing. Since I've got a few slides, I'm going to put this thing on. here. So um, my first slide is big data is a hot topic these days, but I think small data should be a hot topic. Small is beautiful. Small data is good. Big data is a waste. Use small data. Have good taste. Pick what you compute on, right? Why? Blindly computing on lots of data is expensive. Right? As Pete pointed out, data movement is a critical thing. So by definition, if I have lots of big data, I'm doing lots of data movement. That means most of the time I'm not computing, I'm just shoveling bits around, right? That's a truism of every one of these systems. Now, I'm not going to go so far as to say that having a lot of data or using a lot of data isn't sometimes necessary, but that's a different thing than saying using as much data as you can as an end. So the idea of small data computing is that to compute efficiently, you have to minimize the amount of data used and move that data efficiently. Algorithms, right, maybe you ought to think about, and software maybe you ought to think about, how to reduce and winnow the needed data most as rapidly as possible and then quickly focus on deep analysis of the data deemed relevant rather than endlessly churning huge quantities of data. So let, let's get tangible about that. Well, here's some examples. So uh, we recently did some studies um, that actually look at the impact, the impact of uh, operations on energy. So people think, boy, floating point is really floating point is cheap, right? So let's look at a real system. So here's an analysis of an FFT computation comparing doing that FFT with 32-bit floating point operations, single precision, versus fixed point operations, and looking just at the core of the logic power. Uh, and this, com this compares a spectrum of systems. This is a generic kind of risk system. This has some FFT acceleration, and this has FFT acceleration with data movement acceleration. And what you can see is, oh, and they're all normalized, right, to a fixed point implementation. So what this means is that, in fact, floating point, doing this in floating point instead of fixed point makes a minimal difference in the amount of energy this computation requires. Maybe it's as much as 20% for the baseline case. As soon as you add acceleration, it's down to a very, very small percentage, right? And this is in current day technology. So TSMC 32 nanometer CMOS, if that is a familiar idea to you. So operations already don't matter for energy. And if you look in the future, we did a projection out the seven nanometer technology, so a couple of generations out from where we are today, based on you know, some DARPA research model. It turns out that all of these bars drop down to almost exactly one. In fact, the difference is less than one and a half percent, right, as a fraction of the core power, right? That's not the whole system power, just the core power. So the cost and the choice of operations, right, matter almost not at all from an energy point of view and therefore from a performance point of view going forward. Uh, the second thing is I'm arguing for small, small data. So I'm saying don't worry about the operations and the data types. Worry about the data size because that's the first order thing. So if you but instead compare 16-bit versus 32-bit, so half precision, right? Uh, and look at not just core power but the whole system power, right? It already makes a huge difference. So going from 16-bit to 32-bit to 16-bit, reduces the power requirement at the system level, even for a generic risk processor, by 25%. Uh, and if you go to accelerated kinds of implementations, you can see the drop is almost 50%. And that's because almost all the energy is in the data movement, not in the actual operations. And if right, you get a nearly 2x reduction in energy by going to the smaller size data. So data movement and data size dominates over arithmetic type or operation type. So what you thought of as expensive, the operations is not expensive, uh, What you maybe didn't think about too much, right? The data as being the expensive part is the expensive part, 
And that's the rationale for small data. So, so, so trying to make this sort of very graphic and clear, um, these are intended to be ISO energy, you know, kinds of areas for various data sizes. It's chosen to be approximately main memory size, right? So if you took four gigawords of data and you computed across it one operation, right? So take an array of four gigawords and add one to every, every value in that array versus what you could do if you took a large cache, 16 megawords, right? Like you might find on chip today, turns out for the equivalent amount of cost, you could do 8,000 operations on every word in that cache. And then if you went even further, high in the memory hierarchy, like the number to cache, you could do 8 million operations on every one of those values for the same cost it costs you to do one on every word in that main memory. So it's surprising to most people how dramatic this, this change is. So the smaller data enabled a much deeper analysis, both from an energy point of view and a performance point of view. Uh, and so the real impetus here is to use compact representations whenever possible, even at significant increases in the number of operations you have to do in order to get your work done. So small data is cool. We should think about computing on small data because we'll have cool computers then. Uh, and you should think about how to minimize the amount of data you need to actually compute the solution. And algorithms should reduce or winnow the data they need most rapidly and focus on the data on the analysis on the bits that matter the most. Pete, I think you're up. So small data is great. Uh, however, there are times when you have to go big. So uh, you may have seen a recent at uh, Argonne National Laboratory and Cray and Intel announcing a new supercomputer that the laboratory is purchasing. It's uh, about $200 million to get this. This is an artist's rendition. Of course, the design of this computer and everything about this computer is on paper and in people's heads at this point. And over the next several years, it will be constructed and designed and built. And this computer, like other computers, is for going really large, going big, and uh, to give you some background on the size of a computer like this, and then we'll talk about We expect it to be in the 180 to you know, 400 petaflop range. Uh, so that's uh, you know, getting in that 25, 30% of exascale uh, where, we're, where we're trying to push as a laboratory. Now the number of nodes here is about 50,000, but that's 50,000 sockets. Remember that, that everything now about parallelism and about computing is, is parallel, even in the socket. So that socket will have tens, hundreds, possibly, of cores. So we're talking millions of cores. And each one of those cores then has even more parallelism because it's multi-threaded, right? They're hardware threads. So potentially tens or, you know, low, uh, uh, mid, you know, uh, 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 larger than that, maybe 50 million hardware threads is what you can imagine for a computer like this. And uh, uh, Intel is making the chips. And the other interesting thing of note, again, going big, is gigaflops. Uh, and so the entire machine is about 13 megawatts dollars a year of electricity. So that means to just to power a machine like this is about 13 million dollars a year in electricity. And so, again, looking at what Andrew said about changing the data sizes, changing how you do operations has a real effect, not just in how much power, but actually how much we could be billed. In one particular algorithm, you might imagine running that algorithm for several weeks, that could be hundreds of thousands of dollars difference in the electrical cost of running that one algorithm versus another algorithm, even if they take the same amount of time based on op. So if we look at this kind of machine, this enormous machine, and we say, all right, if we are going to go big, we have to program in the big. What prevents scalability? What, what keeps us from getting there? There really are three things that keep us from getting there. I'm going to focus on one as we move forward. One is that you don't have enough parallelism. So if you have that many tens of millions of hardware threads, you have to have lots of parallelism. So if you don't have enough parallelism, you need to scale the problem or do something to get more parallelism. That's in order to use a machine like this. Number two is you know, it takes time to move chunks of work, to move memory around on the machine, and you have to hide that 
so that your, your processor isn't idle. And finally, you might not have enough resources. Now, on this machine, we hope that you have enough resources. So if I focus on just this one for a moment, this comes back to this problem mentioned earlier about the, the way we design algorithms is we imagine the machine to be static. We imagine how we divide up the program into chunks of work. And so if we want to do latency hiding, as we scale the machine, how it becomes more dynamic. As we try and squeeze the power out to make it more efficient, it becomes more dynamic. The power boost, the uh, uh, turbo boost. Uh, if we address resilience, that becomes more dynamic. And of course, as we share things, things become more dynamic. So at the core of going big is being able to handle dynamic behavior. And Google sort of rediscovered this recently. It's a paper that Google wrote called The Tail at the Scale. And it's really a discovery that in the high-performance computing world, we've known for a long time, is that if you are doing tens or hundreds or thousands of tasks, and all of them must complete for you to return a search result, then any one of them, if it's slow, your whole search result, because you're waiting for all of them, becomes slow. And so what Google had done in their, in their uh, data center, they had divided up many of the search operations into lots of little pieces, and they're oversubscribing them on the machine. So the bigger the machine and the more items the higher the probability that one of those ends up being just a little bit late. And so you get this very sad probability curve, which says the larger I scale my machine and the larger I uh, paralyze, the more I divide my operations up, the higher the probability that the search will be too long and you'll go off and start browsing or doing something else. And they want you to stay on that Google page and keep clicking. And so they look at a variety of things. Well, what can we do to solve this? And unfortunately, the, uh, this is what aren't a lot of good answers. You could just live with the latency variable variability. This is actually the only real answer. You could try to reduce variability. Well, uh, uh, that's difficult, given what we talked about with power and everything else. Uh, you could try uh, reducing component. You could try uh, component level variability. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the real... Uh, our takeaway message is that latency must be hidden and that component variability is part of the fabric as we move forward. So, uh, this is sort of a fun one here. If we look, this is a machine, somebody is running a code uh, and this is a standard uh, um, uh, code where it's doing nearest neighbor communication and they're running here uh, and how long it takes uh, their code to run and each processor is reporting back how long it took it to do its work. So in this case, uh, in this particular run, you see that most of the processors came in uh, here, the number of processors came in and it took this amount of time, you know, it's a uh, 38. Uh, there's a little bit of variation. Some took a little bit slower, some are a little faster. Now remember, in this type of computation, when you go big, if you need all of that computation to complete, you're only as fast as your slowest computation, right? So understanding this distribution, this variability in the system is absolutely paramount. And so it turns out like, if you look at this kind of operation here, this is a particular machine, this has very little variability, it's very good for the, for the program. Here, this was horrible. Okay, what is the deal here? Why is this so bad? And so the, the point of this research paper was something went wrong. We have really nice tight variability here. We have here, we have here, here. And in this red section, something is going terribly wrong between the red and then they fixed it and they made this purple. People always think, well, what are the things that lead to variability? What's the problem? Turns out it was the memory management. It was a simple, environment variable which used their memory management inside malloc was being used gave them a little bit more variability in how things were were malloc and that moved them from this regime down to this regime the point is that when jobs are very sensitive to this variability it can appear anywhere it can be in the power management it can be in the clock speed it can be even in the memory malloc and so 
being able to uh, improve and handle latency in this way is the way that we go big, is the way we scale. This turbo boost. This is fun here, just showing the difference. This is the temperature of a chip, in this case in blue here, and we're running this chip here at uh, 2.6 gigahertz, and Turbo Boost turns on at anything above 2.6 gigahertz on this particular chip. So if we make it 2.6.01 gigahertz, suddenly we get the Turbo Boost, and the temperature of the chip bumps up really high, drops down low, and goes like this. The variability of the computation then is tremendous. So if we look on a processor, when, when these advanced features, which are using, being done to manage power, happen, we see in this kind of example, here's the CPU frequency. One of the processors here is jumping up, slowing down, jumping up, slowing down, because it's right at the thermal limit of what it's allowed to do. And so it's bumping up against that limit, sometimes running faster, sometimes running slower. And that has a real effect on gigaflops. So again, built in, baked into the beginning is that the entire machine is way more variable. Work is equal time is not there. So how pliable does our code need to be? How do we handle the notion that as we write code, we need to write for a distribution of pieces, that we don't have equal work is equal time? So we need to understand in our head, what is that shape of the performance distribution? How much latency do we need to hide? Can we build in a predictive model? A lot of folks are moving toward a more graph-oriented model to provide as much parallelism and understand the dependence. <coughs> so to summarize this, as we go big, we have to understand that, yes, code should be as static as possible, but no more so that equal work is not equal time. So step one is prepare and create flexibility in your program. That flexibility has to be over decomposition. If you writing a parallel program say, I have N items, I have P processors, I'll divide my work, N, P, divide up the chunks, you've statically divided up in a way that does not handle variability. So over decomposing into more chunks and having that be a little bit better with load balancing or other techniques is where you have to go. So you first have to prepare your code with this kind of flexibility built in. Then you can take small steps to becoming more pliable for this kind of variability. You can map resources if you know some processors are slower or faster. You can do periodic load balancing. You can uh, define what kind of uh, graph dependency you might have. But in the is really goal-oriented optimization, where the execution is based on what needs to be accomplished as opposed to all processors doing N operations, and when all N operations are done, I do a global synchronize and I'm complete. And things are only getting more complicated. As uh, Andrew pointed out, uh, in terms of the chips, this is an example chip from AMD. Uh, looking into the future, we see uh, stacks of memory and we see stacks of, uh, uh, of uh, high bandwidth memory built into the key of memory. So this idea of, of static is replaced, as was said, with very dynamic behavior where the different speeds of memory are is quite wide even within the chip. And so taking advantage of building in flexibility and putting in goals for the, for the uh, application uh, for how you execute the code is a way to solve your variability problem. Thanks, Pete. So I think we're doing well on time, so I can take a few more minutes here. So that is a huge sort of macro trend, and we'll have to uh, shape your thinking and affect uh, how computing evolves over the next decade or more. Uh, is that we're moving to a world in which customization is no longer an option. It's essential for efficiency. Uh, and the way to think about this is that you perhaps were taught that computer science was about layered abstractions. And this is, for performance reasons, the breaking down or the efficient implementation of these abstractions, depending on how you want to think about it. So if you take a notion of a program and data structures, right, the way we render that is in program, right, that has structure and spatial structure and organization, and then that eventually operates on some kind of an underlying hardware substrate. 
for those of you who are hardware wonks, that's the motherboard from the new MacBook Air. So efficient computing requires that you match the algorithmic structure and the data movement structure to the software structure and to the hardware. Because at the lowest level, the closest physical structure is going to produce the most efficient data movement, right? You know from your physics classes, if I move electrons from here to there, or to move them further. So the closer the structure matches, uh, the more efficient the implementation you're going to get. And right now, we have all kinds of overheads, right, to that efficiency that come from things like generality. We have general purpose instruction. We have general purpose addressing. We have various sizes of different kinds of operations that are all sufficient to build large complex computations. And that was all wonderful. But in fact, that generality is expensive, right? Because then we have to do a lot of stuff in order to get a little bit of work done. The second thing that's surprising to most people is the wrong size. We all know too small is expensive because then you have to spill out and go to the next layer and so on. It turns out too big is expensive too. If you're using 64-bit words, when you could use 32. You have to move twice as much data. If you're using 16 megabyte caches when your data is only two megabytes, you're powering up and churning a lot more physical structure in the system. So you really would like to have a system which, in, in which everything is just big enough for your particular computation on your particular data set on your particular run. Seems unattainable, but that's the goal. And then the second thing is that the software, way we like to write software and the way it has to be realized uh, there's a huge gap, and that gap is becoming more and more important. So what we really want to, to be able to execute the software most efficiently is the most predictable static explicit structure to the actual data movement and control structure that the program is actually going to exhibit. And for a lot of years, frankly, the hardware architects have allowed the software folks to ignore this. But actually, we're starting to see that come unravel. So what you really want to have is cloned and specialized versions for concrete data types and concrete plus programmer, you don't want in the implementation of the program a virtual function for add to set or, or add operation, right, that works on all data types. What you want is a clone and specialized one that can actually connect to the specific machine primitive to do that directly, right? Likewise, you don't want abstract high-level virtual functions, right, or generics, right, that are going to use pointers and implement via clever type-dependent dispatching or virtual function tables branches or procedures or other things that impede optimization or cost. What you really want to have is highly optimized libraries that have been lowered down to the level that the machine knows exactly what's going to happen and, happen, and can make that happen explicitly via exhaustive optimization or auto-tuning. Because you not only need to have these structures aligned, you need to have them aligned with as little runtime effort as possible. So let me give some examples of that, because that may be a little hard to, 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 to think about. So if you pull out your, your phone. If you have anything but an iPhone, like a lot of people in this room with iPhones, chances are you've got something like a Qualcomm Snapdragon device inside. Play one chip, but this is basically the set of functions you have inside of a Qualcomm platform. Um, and it includes, way, way up in the corner here, the general purpose CPU that you're used to thinking about as the computer. But it's also got a digital signal processor, right? That's doing various kinds of sensor processing and sensor data processing. It's got a bunch of multimedia accelerators that understand things like, well, in this case, 4K uh, uh, TV, 4K HD TV, amazing in a phone, right? Uh, voice, you know, processing, various kinds of uh, 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 video encoding and decoding. You've got image uh, and signal processors uh, and so on. Uh, you've got modem stuff, right, that deals with the radio and so on. You've got a GPU, right? You've got things that do display and touch kind of processing, and then you've got location stuff. So this is specialization, specialization, specialization all over the place right now. So you look at that and say, well, Andrew, you're talking about specialization and customization. They're already there. Aren't we done yet? Has anyone here wrote a, written a program for a mobile device or a smartphone? The reality is you can't hardly get your software anywhere except here. The rest of that in most smartphones today. Maybe you can get on the GPU if you work really hard using open, open uh, CL or something like that. So, so one of the things that we've been working on is this idea of can you actually bring this kind of customization into a mainstream programmable kind of space? So we have a project called 10 by 10 that's looking at this idea of federated customization. And we're not the only ones looking at this. But the idea here is instead of having a bunch of big accelerators right on that chip, 
Instead, what we have is the notion of a core that's been generalized, right? And that that are extremely efficient and specialized to do certain narrower kinds of computation. Uh, and the way we make this programmable is you federate these things together all under one instruction stream. So you program it the traditional way with the C program or something like that, or some appropriate higher level language. And because you have a shared memory hierarchy, perhaps a local memory, but also a shared memory hierarchy, and that all being executed under a single instruction stream, what you have is you have programmability and flexible compilation. So think of it as turning this customization inside out. In that Qualcomm example, on at any point in time, if you take a 10 by 10 approach, you tile up a chip and one little slice of each of the tiles is on at any particular point in time. And therefore switching between them and moving data between them is much more easy and efficient. So how much can this kind of stuff help? Well, you probably all know that in these traditional kinds of accelerator SOCs, you know, when you do video playback on your phone, you can do video playback for 10 times longer, maybe 50 times longer, right? Because of that little specialized accelerator, then you could with the CPU. That's why you can watch a two hour uh, MPEG video on your phone, right? Well, it turns out that if you apply this 10 by 10 style of approach and you look at a range of different sort of subcomputations, that you can see performance increases from 100 to several thousand. We didn't draw the bars here because they would have gone off the screen. It would be a terrible looking picture. Uh, and the main point here is that this kind of customization is capable of producing dramatically larger benefits than you can get from technology scaling. So we did a projection that looks at the nanometer. Wow, you know, in a three generation ahead kind of extrapolation, you might get as much as four times improvement right, in performance. But if you apply customization, you can get factors of 10 or even 100. So the performance in the energy story is really sort of overwhelming for these kinds of customization approaches. And that's the idea I'm trying to convey. Okay, so that was the hardware story, right? And, you know, sometimes people, you know, oh, yeah, I, I understand a little bit about physics. I understand the hardware story. I could, I could, I could grok that. Um, but it's also very interesting that what's going on uh, It's become important to invest a lot of effort in this kind of software customization for efficiency because the overheads for general purpose software have become quite large. So there was recently a really wonderful, unique controlled study in dynamic software customization. Um, NVIDIA built two chips that were almost identical, right? So they built two Tegras. They called them the same thing, Tegra K1. Very confusing, right? But one of them has a quad-core A15 ARM core in it, and the other has this very special dual Denver CPU. It's some very, very neat technology around software customization. So let me explain what that is. Um, one of the important differences here is that this is, these are a three-way superscalar, right? So three instructions per clock, and the dual Denver CPUs are each seven-way superscalar, right? And in a traditional setting, it would make no sense to produce a seven-way superscalar because you couldn't find enough instruction-level parallelism to actually keep this thing busy. So what did they do? Well, so um, building on some technology, the history of x86 processors, you may remember a small company called Transmeta that for a time built the best low-power processors. Um, and they built this amazing system that does real-time translation and optimization of software in order to both make use of this seven-way superscalar uh, and to reduce the power and increase the efficiency of the execution. So what they have is they have specialized hardware that does dynamic profiling of the ARM instructions coming down the pipe, uh, and it feeds that information to an optimizer that looks at little sub and based on the actual usage of the instructions, the actual data types, interprocedural kind of flow, and so on. Right, so think of it as binary optimization in real time. Think of it as jitting on the binary program, right? Uh, and it does all of these kinds of things. And it produces and stores it in some specialized structures on the chip, an optimized code cache. Think of that as the code cache inside of a chip. So the idea is this CPU using these tools is gonna generate the best code path and the smallest code size based on dynamic information, stuff that the right, and based on hotness information, how often that stuff is used based on the real execution of the program. What do they get for this? Turns out 
they produce the processor that has two times the single thread performance. So this very thing that no one else has been able to get for the last five, 10 years, we've been talking about 10% a year, they got 100% improvement in single thread performance versus this Cortex A15, which is already an out of order core at the same power. Pretty remarkable. So this software customization and lowering port can be remarkably effective. Um, give you an idea of what's really going on to make sure it came through clearly. Uh, this is an example of a profile of execution over time. And for each of these units of time, there's a notion of 100% of the time. And it could be spent either doing the actual work in the application. It could be doing uh, uh, work in that hardware decoder that's manually or in the hardware translating those ARM things into the Denver instruction set. Uh, and uh, this the interprocedural lowering of the code. And what you can see is when you start the thing up, it does a lot of stuff that is overhead and not that much on the actual application. But over time, it rapidly transforms all of that execution time right, into very, very efficient execution on the application uh, and allows you to actually make use of that 7-wide VLIW, which you could not fill any other way, VLIW superscalar, and it learns that optimized code and it keeps it. So it's very interesting that using these kinds of techniques and reducing the overhead with hardware support, they were power envelope, right, at the same clock rate approximately uh, in this project, uh, Denver new 64-bit CPU. And I think it's worth noting that parts of this dynamic code optimization or uh, customization can be done at the application programming tool packaging uh, and so on level. It doesn't need to just be done right at this low level uh, in the hardware architecture, right? So, but to wrap this all up, right? The idea is that in the future, if you want to be most efficient, your application computation algorithms and data structure in a very clean and clear way into the program representation, and that needs to map in a very clean and clear way in a corresponding way into the hardware uh, if you're going to get maximum efficiency. Um, so. Uh, uh, you know, in order to do that as often as possible, if you're a software developer, you need to find a way to grow and exploit a wide variety of the increasing class of these customized hardware engines that's going to be out there. Uh, and um, you need to be thinking about how to do customization of your software structure to enable that close matching, right? So, which of course is good for functionality and leverage and portability and all those things, has to be balanced, right, with this strong pull right, for maximum efficiency uh, in this lowering. Now, of course, customization, I've talked mostly at the chip level. It's also critical at the data center level, at the large scale structure level. That's a whole nother talk. I won't talk about that today. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I, I'll just leave you with the thought of, you really need to think about how to exploit customization for efficiency in the kinds of computations or systems that you care about. And of course, right, the goal should be all of this without resorting to low level assembly language programming. Nobody wants that as the outcome of all of this. So with that, Pete, do you want to come back up here? We're at the end. Yeah. yeah so so just to recap here, of course, uh, what we know is that sometimes more operations are actually better. Uh, it is all about the data movement, not about counting apps. So uh, when you take your analysis of algorithms class and you're asked to uh, uh, look and say, wait, let's talk about data movement and uh, see how far that gets you. Um, uh, the second is when you're asked uh, in your next class to write a program, you should immediately ask, wait, are we writing parallel programs today or sequential programs? And again, uh, see how far that gets you. <laughs> and uh, you know, summarize yours. Uh, yeah, I would argue there are no sequential programs anymore. Um, so. Uh, uh, next time you hear somebody say, oh, well, we don't have to do a good job of implementing that because, you know, Moore's Law will come and sweep away. All uh, you should remind them that rapid exponential improvement, right, is is over. And, you know, perhaps we have slow improvement for a while. We've been able to waste for a long time, but I think the time for wasting uh, is now past. Um, it's a, it's a wide, widely uh, uh, widespread misconception that computers run at fixed speed. Uh, and I think the reality is they're increasingly dynamic and flexible. Uh, that's both the complication in the context of memory hierarchies, but it's also an advantage. For some of the things that Pete talked about, 
where you have variability. Absolutely, very computation. But guess what? You have a knob to control the speed of your computer. So if you could combine somehow intelligent adjustment of those knobs with global information about what matters for your computation, and this matters at multiple scales, not just in the multi-million core systems that'll be built out at Argonne, but it'll matter in small data center kinds of computations and perhaps ultimately even at the chip level uh, for getting you know, real results out. And then finally, um, after many decades of being able to blissfully ignore what was going on afraid that algorithm designers and software tool chain uh, developers uh, are going to have to deal with acceleration uh, and customization uh, to a significant degree. And the reason is the performance difference, the energy difference is so large as to be you know, almost impossible to ignore. And that Moore's law won't allow the general purpose systems to catch up. So you can't just neglect the problem and have it go away in a few years. So we, we came with the intention of not only pointing out a few things that might be misconceptions, uh, but we about how to think about future computing. So one such suggestion is to think about small data or right size data computing. So operations are cheap, data movement is expensive, algorithms should use as little data as possible, but can afford very rich analysis on that data. And of course, computing in large uh, means understanding the tail. And so variation across the system is inevitable. And the real question is how, as programmers, as designers, are you going to deal with over, decomp over decompose? How do you optimize? How do you reschedule? And so that sort of intelligent optimization and scheduling is how you should now start to look at algorithms that are in the big. And then finally, um, you know, we've been able to, to depend on an unbelievable tailwind. Right, this tremendous engine of Moore's law for increasing performance and delivering capability of computing into every corner right, of the physical infrastructure in every corner of the world. And it's been truly amazing. If we're going to continue that kind of progress, law scaling, we're going to have to exploit customized hardware and software to squeeze out what could be very, very large increases in performance and capability, uh, but they're going to require effort on our part uh, to exploit that customization uh, to increase you know, and continue this revolution that computing is driving throughout the economy and throughout the world. So with that, thank you for your attention, and we'd be happy to take some questions.